Hey everybody, welcome to our Hillcrest online service. I'm Pastor Andrew, I'm glad you could be with me here this morning. And next week we are planning on being in person live. This week we were hoping to be live today, unfortunately, as in in person, but didn't have chairs, we're missing a few key volunteers in places. Anyway, that's all set and ready for next week. Chairs should be arriving earlier this week just in a few days, I should say, and so we'll be all set. So I uh, just want to welcome you here. It's uh, St. Patty's Day week upcoming, so get your green on and get your luck of the Irish going. Uh, I would have brought my plant, Steve, who's a clover, but he's getting kind of big, so I don't really want to be moving him around. With that, why don't we open up with prayer and invite our Lord Jesus Christ to join us uh, through the Holy Spirit uh, in a, for our service this morning. Let's pray. God, thank you once again for another day where we are alive and have the ability to worship you and to praise you and to give you thanks and to lift up your holy name together as the family of God. So Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would meet with us this morning and we pray that your blessings would overtake us through this service, that we'd hear from your Holy Spirit and you would touch our hearts today. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, got a few announcements. I already mentioned how the chairs will be in a little bit later uh, this week. So when we have chairs, it's going to change our situation in the sanctuary. So we will be able to seat up to 102 people. Now they tell us we're allowed 50% of our capacity, so that's well within our range. So when you come in on Sunday, you don't need to register online. You don't need to register by phone. You just kind of show up and the usher will ask you how many are seating with you. So what's going to happen is you'll see it's staggered. So this is actually about 12 feet away from the stage. So our singers can ha no, don't have to wear masks. And so this will be six feet away. So there's six feet between these chairs, between these chairs. And you got the aisles here and the walls here. So we have seats for four and seats for two. So if you have a group of five, oh, we'll just take one of these chairs and slide it over. Or on this side, we have three and three. So if we need to, we can just slide two over here. But anyways, the ushers are gonna take care of moving the chairs, but when you come in, you'll tell the ushers how many people that you're planning to have sitting with you. Now, we still have it so it can only be six max in a row. So be thinking about that as you make preparations uh, because we gotta have room for people to move back and forth and to use washrooms, which are about over here. But anyhow, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. If you come as one person, then we'll just slide one of these single chairs here so you can sit by yourself. If you have one significant other, then listen, we don't have a fireplace, but you can cozy right up next to each other in your little seats. So we're looking forward to be able to do that. Uh, I always forget, so put it in bright yellow letters here. Uh, just, just take a moment. Uh, you've been so faithful in your giving. Uh, we still can't pass the offering plate on a Sunday morning, even when we're live. So we're going to ask that you continue to give how you've been giving, uh, whether through e-transfer, over the phone, with your visa, or whatever you use, or dropping it off in the mail slot with a check, or however you want to do that, however God's put it on your heart to give, we ask that you continue to keep doing that way. So let's have a word of prayer. We haven't done that enough in the last while uh, for the offering, for the tithes and offering. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd sensitize our hearts. Lord, I think of 
how you've been so good to us and so generous to us. Lord, here we are in Canada. And Lord, we're going through this pandemic. We're going through this pandemic in a first world nation. Lord, we give you thanks. We couldn't have asked uh, for this privilege, but Lord, here we are. And help us to have a spirit of generosity as we give. Help us to think intentionally about how we give, that we might honor you with our heart. We pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. And some of you have your automatic withdrawal set up. So that's great. You guys are all taken care of. I just want to let you know that worshiping practice is at 730 for those who are involved in that. And they practiced last week. That was a lot of fun. Had lots of laughs and got a couple of things going. I just want to say a special welcome back to Alex McKinnon, Annie, his wife, Abel, their little baby boy and baby who knows what her name is going to be uh, when she arrives. And uh, welcome back from Ontario, guys. It's nice to have you back home. Um, David Steves and Dr. Buckingham, we have a little update for you. So uh, we met with him the other night and we will be uh, meeting with our board of directors uh, this upcoming Tuesday. We're going to invite our deacons team. So deacons, board of directors, we'll see you all on the fourth Tuesday of the month to kind of go over some of the plans and make sure we have the leadership all on board what we're doing. And then hopefully early April, we'll be able to meet as a congregation in the sanctuary, both with Zoom and in person uh, to pitch some, some ideas and, and get some feedback from you as a congregation because we need to know what is you know we've got some stuff to do in 2021 but really when i look at the way t uh, the pandemic is fizzling out will uh, we want to aim to hit 2022 incredibly prepared so that's what we're doing now we're getting ready uh, there might be some things and opportunities like we're getting some things ready for uh, christmas already we've we've actually uh, put an order in for the horses for our christmas in the park we're expecting to be able to move forward with some of these things. So we've got, we're just planning ahead. And I think that's uh, honorable to do uh, as a church. So just wanna let you know what's going on with that. We had some really great news. So Friday night, uh, Zahib and myself, uh, we've been in contact with an Anglican minister named Nazir Gill in Thailand. And uh, we've just been praying for his family uh, that they would, uh, be able to get sponsorship to come to Canada. And anyhow, there's been a church organization in Ontario and out in BC that have worked together to bring him and five other families, uh, his nephews and their families, uh, to Canada. Now, we ha still have a situation in Thailand where you've got several hundred Christian families that have no escape. Uh, Anyways, this, this is on my heart, and so Zahib and I will be meeting with some of these other families and just to pr be praying with them, to encourage them, to let them know that the greater body of Christ loves them and is aware of their situation and to let them know they're not forgotten. So anyhow, this is just kind of as we get ourselves moving again, this is something that's been on my heart, uh, you know, the international community and how are we reaching them as a church and how are we being the body of Christ uh, on a global scale. So. These are some opportunities that God has opened up to us. And, you know, we're just going to see what God would have us do as a congregation. And anyhow, that's just a little update. We were just so pleased. We've been talking with Nazir now for two years. And now it'll be another year and a half wait uh, for him before he can come to Canada. But we're expecting good things. And they were so happy to be able to share that with us. Anyhow, enough announcements for now. We'll, we'll have a few more announcements in a few minutes, but why don't we take some time out for the kids of we'll our children's story with Zach. So Zach, can you take us away? Good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're having a great day. If you don't know who I am, my name is Zachary Peabody. And today I want to talk to you guys and girls about the Bible verse for today. And so that is found in John 15. And so if you don't know where that is, at the front of your Bible, there's gonna, it's going to say John under New Testament. And so you're going to find that page number. You're going to scroll through it. Not scroll through it, but you're going to go through your book. And you're going to look for a big number 15, okay? So it's, it's John 15. So it's in the New Testament. You're going to look for John. And you're going to look for a big 15, okay? And the, and the verses that I want to talk to you, boys and girls, about is the very first two verses. And so I'm going to read them, and then I want to talk to you about them. So this is what it says. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. 
Now, the person talking in this verse, his name is Jesus. He's pretty cool, and he's talking to his, his friends. And so what he's talking about here is about the actions and things we do in our lives. And so there are good actions, and there are also bad actions. And so what Jesus is telling his friends is that he wants us to do the good actions that please him. So being nice to people, reading your Bible, praying. But also he doesn't he wants us to stop doing things that he necessarily doesn't like, like maybe taking that extra cookie that was meant for your brother or uh, playing video games longer uh, after your mom and dad tell you to stop. So this is what Jesus is talking about here when he says about branches. Branches would be actions or things that we do in our lives. So what Jesus is telling us is that we need to stop doing uh, those bad things that can hurt and harm people and maybe be disobedient to our parents. I know I've done that. I know it's a shocker, but you know, I've been disobedient to my parents before and I've had to stop making those bad decisions. And so I need to keep on doing those good things. And so, yeah. And remember, God loves you. Hope you guys have a great day. Bye. Great. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, now I just want to give you some updates about our Easter program. So we have, uh, our, we are going to be combining with Lancaster for a video. So we're going to be having communion on Good Friday. It's going to be a video. We're going to have our baptism aspect of the service. We're going to be having uh, some of the worship teams take part and send the videos all kind of compile together because Lancaster is our sister church and we have the same mission and we just want to partner with them on this uh, Good Friday like we have in the past. So we'll have a Good Friday video with Lancaster. Uh, we're going to be having a uh, we're going to do a sunrise devotional, but then we realized, hey, that's outside. So uh, we're going to have a sunrise outdoor. You can join me if you want at the actual sunrise time. As we get a little closer, we'll, we'll mention it. And we're going to video it live for those who want to stay home and be toasty. Uh, but for those who want to gather for the sunrise devotional, uh, we're going to meet at All Saints, All Saints Rest, All Saints by the Irving Nature Park. <laughs> we're going to at the first park line, and we're going to have a little uh, devotional there at sunrise so uh, just as you get ready for that uh, we're also gonna have a week of events uh, of leading up to uh, our Easter services we have an egg decorating night planned and we also have a baking video with Dawn Star remember she made us the Christmas stuff Christmas bark and now she can teach us to make something of Easterish and then we have a children's book reading with Kathy O'Connor and then Allie's gonna do a children's craft with us and then we're gonna have uh, a devotion with Pastor Sterling that week so each day we'll release a little something special as we lead up to Easter. Sunday morning, we are still planning on having a drive-in service. So uh, again, thank you Northside Assemblies for lending us your FM transmitter, and we'll be uh, doing that in our parking lot. Now, as you get parked in, we're going to have some parking attendants. As you get parked in, uh, the kitchen crew will be bringing out uh, some things for you. They'll be bringing out uh, breakfast. They'll be bringing out uh, communion elements. So we have this little pre-packaged uh, juice and uh, cracker wafer something uh, for you to take because at the end of our drive-in service we're going to take communion together because in our services we're not allowed to take our masks down so we just want to be able to share that time together so we can do it in the car we can have breakfast together like we do most Easter's it's just gonna be a really fun service so we're looking forward to that why don't we take a moment and go to Sue and Jeff's basement and while we have a uh, time of worship together let them just bless your hearts Sue Jeff Take us away.
great. Thank you so much, Sue and Jeff. Uh, now we're going to have our scripture reading, and we're going to be taken from John chapter 15. And as we talk about our message today, Twisted Gifts, I just want you to imagine that, well, let's we'll read the scripture first, then we'll get to our message, right? Okay. It says this in John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine. This is Jesus speaking. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So that will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Oh yeah, let's get to the word, eh? Or, so we're going to have our sermon now. Twisted gifts. So when I think about God flowing through us, uh, there's many images in the Bible about broken vessels and such. But because life sends us twists and turns, uh, there's things that can happen that kind of mess up the way the gifts flow through us. Now, uh, Romans 11.29 says, God's gifts and His call are irrevocable, which means the things that God has placed in you, He's not going to take them away no matter what happens in your life. So what can happen is we can get wounded, we can get twisted up inside with unforgiveness. We can have these different things happen to us. And then the gifts that God has for us, suddenly they don't flow the same way. And instead of being filled with the power of God, it's just like someone trying to water a garden with a hose like this. It's going through the motions, but there's no power. And then what happens is that those who are supposed to be, because, you know, all the gifts are to build up the body of Christ. So those who are expecting to be built up instead are receiving no nourishment and they wither. And they die because they're not being watered by the Spirit of God. There's, there's nothing coming out of you that's supposed to be uh, becoming onto people. So the, the water is still there. The Spirit of God is still there in your life. But just as God has placed these gifts in you, uh, you know, Satan comes at us and he tries to keep us from being able to use our gifts in the very first place. I think what our goal here today is to look at ourselves, to so a self-examination, very much like Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And this is, again, the Bereans. The Bereans uh, heard the message from Paul, who was an apostle, a prophet, a preacher, a teacher. He was, had many, many gifts. And despite all that, despite his titles, despite his notoriety or infamy, depending on how you look at him, they decided to question him and make sure that what he was saying lined up with Scripture. And so today, I want to just examine our own lives and just see, is there any twist in my life? Is there a wound in my life that is making the gifts that God has given me be used in the wrong way? And so this is a chance for us to just kind of self-examine. And it's also a good way to wrap up our, our talks on the gifts and to kind of go through the, the list again. So. When it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, um, a, a gift can, you know, like I was saying earlier, a gift can be healthy for the church, it can build it up, or it can be detrimental, right? It can be offer nothing, right? And, or it can even be, in some senses, in some cases, as we get going down the list, it can actually tear down. That which can build up can also tear down. A hammer is a tool, and it can build or it can tear down. Same as the gifts. So we want to make sure that those things, uh, that the gifts of God are flowing through us and that they're healthy. So let's, let's begin through looking at uh, some of these spiritual gifts. So we're looking at the gift of prophet first. First. So a prophet is able to see differently than other people. It's part of their gift. They can see uh, what's going on, the situation that's going on, and they look at it through different perspective. And a lot of times they look at it through God's perspective. But if you've got a wound happening, you might look at something and, and all you're seeing is through the filter of your own pain, of your own wounds, and you're looking at someone and you're judging them through your own past experiences and you're not seeing what God's doing, but your own hurt, your own perspective, and then you develop a critical spirit and you look at, well, I'm done with that church because they got this problem. Well, folks, listen, there's no church that has no problems. 
right? We're, it's, a, it's a gathering of human beings. In fact, to gather at a church, you have to confess that you're a sinner, right? You have to confess that you've got something wrong with you. You're struggling. A church is a hospital, and even the doctors are wounded. So, you know, and, and we all come together. And our great physician, Jesus Christ, he, I, we were healed by his wounds. So anyhow, let's keep on target here, talk about the prophet. So a prophet, a person with the gift of prophecy can see things that other people can't see. And sometimes they can be happy when everyone else is sad because they can see what's going to come around the turn. Or when everyone else is happy, they can be sad because they can see what's coming around the turn. But sometimes they just get this critical spirit. And instead of being part of the solution, they just name what the problem is, or they name what they see what's wrong, or they see what's coming around the corner and say, I'm out of here. <laughs> Many times God asked, had to ask Jeremiah, you know, stay with these people, speak to these people, don't leave them. Uh, so Jeremiah 23, 30 to 32 also talks about some other pitfalls for prophets. It says, therefore declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly for me. So you would call this like circular reasoning. So uh, people who don't hear from God themselves, but hear from another prophet, or, you know, they start to, to talk amongst each other and they start to uh, try and to come up with a theory or, or someone says, oh, this pastor here said this, so it's got to be true. And they start preaching what that person said instead of hearing God for themselves. You know, just because you really respect a prophet doesn't mean that you have the right to just repeat what they're saying. You need to hear from God for yourself, especially if you're in that role. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. What does that mean? That's when people manipulate their gifts. And I talked about heart prophecies in the past, but this idea of, oh, the Lord told me, or I feel that the Lord is leading. And I try as a pastor, I try not to ever use that as a trump card when I'm in a deacon's meeting or any kind of board of directors. Why well, really feel that God told me we need to be doing this? Because that puts me in a really precarious position and puts our, our, our leadership teams in a precarious position. Like, how do you speak up? when the pastor says God told him, right? Uh, that's, that's really tricky. So I try not to go there. Uh, I try and, and, and use the body and the gifts that the body uh, has been given. I try and look at who you are and, and try and see, okay, Lord, you've brought these gifts together. You brought these personalities together. You've brought these people together for a reason. Just like God gave me my wife, she compliments me very well. And I don't just mean she says, ooh, you're... <laughs> Okay. But I mean, she, she, she helps me where I'm strong. She may not be as strong. Where she's strong, I'm definitely not as strong. And so we work together, we complement each other. So these people, um, they, stay, they put God's name in front of them so that people will maybe kowtow to them, so turn their brains off. Well, if God said it, I don't want to be the person who doesn't have faith. Or, you know, we got to be able to engage our minds. God gave us these beautiful creations, our minds to be able to think things through. So, you know, I'm the kind of pastor that if you have questions or you want to challenge or push back on some things that I'm saying, great. Why? Because I'm not the smartest man in the room and I know it and it's okay. But I'm smart enough to know that God has sent me you. That's right. He sent me you because you have certain gifts and strengths that I don't have. And I have gifts and strengths that you don't have. So we're actually for each other. We're the body of Christ for building each other up. But when I use that term, God told me, and I'm the pastor, using my title and using God's name, when he didn't tell me, ah, you know, we got to avoid those kind of conversations because it, it shuts down conversations. Indeed, I'm against those who prophesy false dreams declares Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send or appoint them. Just because someone has profit in front of their name, you still got to check their track record. It says they do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. And if you think about these roles, the role of profit, any of these gifts, again, is for the building up of the body of Christ. It is to benefit the body of Christ. It's not to make them rich or powerful or famous or have more YouTube or TikTok viewers. It is to build up the body of Christ. Matthew 7, 15 says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. 
They have an agenda. They have appetites they want to feed. The three sin temptations are what? Their eyes, uh, lust of the flesh, uh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so people might use this position or this gift to feed their own appetites. They might, uh, they might try and use their position to manipulate other people. But I'll tell you right now, um, you're doing that, you're playing with fire because God is not mocked. And if God is opposed to someone, you know, God says, I am against them. You know, it also says God opposes the proud. Like, God, if you if you're wondering, like, what's God doing? You just read the book of Habakkuk because that's where the prophet asks God, like, if you're a God of justice, why is this happening? God's like, oh, don't you worry, I'm on top of this. <laughs> like, you, you trust God that he's going to take care of this. But if that's you, if you're, if you're using the gifts that God has given you, if you're trying to use God's name to get your own way, like you need to reconsider what you're doing. Let's move on. Okay, so now we're talking about evangelists and apostles. Yes, I've got <laughs> Chuck Norris here as Lone Wolf McQuaid. What I find sometimes with apostles and evangelists is they are called to get things happening. And let's be honest, the church is like the Titanic. It does not move swiftly. It's not a sleek uh, speedboat that can avoid icebergs very well. You know, it takes time to move around. And so there are people with certain gifts, apostles, evangelists, they, man, they want to get out there. They want to get going. And instead of waiting for the body of Christ, sometimes they go out by themselves and that usually leads to trouble. What? There's, there's some tricks that Satan has, right? See, he'll speed you up so fast that you trip and fall. He'll he'll make you stop exactly where you are, so you're no good to anybody. Or he'll slow you down so bad that, again, you know, it's it's it's, it's finding that pace that God has called us to be upon or to be a, with Him. And I remember Gerard de Toy once said, you know, God is not in a hurry. <sighs> I'm in a hurry. I live in I live in St. John, man. Like if I go through McDonald's, I could wait two minutes for my through the line. I, I get impatient. But the truth is, God is not in a hurry. We need to align ourselves with His pace. Now there are moments where there's strong momentum, and man, you got to work and you got to run and you got to go with it. But there's other moments where God's like, hold off, hold on, I'm doing something. You've got to wait. Hold on, hold on. Now go right, and that's just kind of how God is. So when we look at Scripture. We look at uh, Luke chapter 10, we see that when God sent the disciples out to spread the good news, he sent them out in pairs. He didn't send anybody out alone. And we see oftentimes how people get in trouble without accountability, right? I know some people that they think it's a great idea to go to the bar and, and to uh, you know do evangelism there. Yeah, there's a few people that can do that, but the ones I know of that have been successful at it have done it under a church covering, and while they're out there, people praying for them. Like, there's a whole system. It's not just somebody thinking, yeah, I'm going to go to the bar and lead people to Christ. Hey, listen, maybe that's your gift, and maybe I'm completely wrong on that, but I've seen some people tripped up on it too. So uh, be, caught, be very careful in that. I don't think we're called to go out alone. I think we're supposed to be part of a mission. And that's the beauty of the local church. So you might think to yourself, well, I don't have to be a Christian to go to church. Well, no, duh, right? But the local body provides opportunities to present the gospel in a way that is much more trusted than just an individual. Because as an organization, as, as a group of people, we have accountability. We have accountability measures in place. We have people working as a team. We can organize things together. We can uh, do things more and better together in reaching our community. Uh, more than one person can by themselves. That's why we gather together as the body of Christ. It's not just... You know, it's not just to identify, oh, I'm a Christian because I carried my Bible to church this week. No, no, I'm a part of the body of Christ. I'm involved in the ministries of the church. I am giving finances to, to support. I'm, this is my home. This is where I receive support from as well. Let's keep going. So evangelists, apostles, they can get tired of waiting for the church to move and they go off on their own and they get in trouble. So just, you know, be careful of that. If that's, if that's you, if that's your gift. I know church can be slow going. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait on the Lord, right? And renew your strength. Let's keep going. So next is the exhorter. Exhorter is a person that comes alongside to uh, encourage you or to kick your butt to get you moving ahead. Now, a person with a gift of exhortation, I, I've seen this before, they can have 
uh, a, an ability to um, use their words in such a way as to tear people apart. So they, they see the things through a negative lens and they call people out on a negative lens. And instead of being uh, someone that, that encourages people and builds them up, it just simply tears them down and leaves them it's like, hey, you're nothing. You are no good. Look at this in your life. Blah, 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 blah. And the attitude that's brought with it leaves people hurting and it doesn't build up a body of Christ. In fact, it tears it down. Proverbs 18, 21 says the tongue has the power of life and death. It has the power to build up and to tear down. And those who love it will eat its fruit. And so we need to be careful how we speak to others, especially if you're supposed to be an encourager. Like, don't stop encouraging. Continue to work in that. Don't get flustered with the situation. Continue to speak words of life, love, and affirmation. Even if people say, oh, you're naive, or whatever they say, you know what? You stick to your guns. You stick to what God's telling you to speak into people's lives. And you speak words of life. Let's keep going. Now, this isn't one of the ones on the list, uh, but the gift of prayer, the gift of intercession, the role of intercessor in the church, we didn't talk about that as a spiritual gift because it wasn't in those lists, but it is definitely uh, something I see in the body of Christ. There's certain people who have such an affinity to prayer and, and the realm of prayer. And what happens, this gift can be twisted because I, I find that it's actually those who are warriors are actually supposed to be warriors. First Peter 5, 7, 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. See, a warrior is holding on to all their cares as if they can do something about it, or it gives them the illusion that they're, they're doing something about it by, by continuing to think about it and, and worrying about it and, and not leaving it alone and, and trying to pick at it. It's like, you need to take that which is worrying you and give it up to God. And sometimes we need to give it to him over and over and over again so that we can receive the peace that comes through the breakthrough of prayer. And I'm not saying this is going to be five minute prayer of just, you know, sometimes we sit at the dinner table and say, Lord, thank you for this food, bless your bodies. Amen. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about your sons, your daughters, your children, your cousins, your parents. There's a situation and it is weighing you down. You need to bring that to the Lord. You need to spend some time in prayer. Get on your knees by the side of your bed. Sit in a chair. It doesn't matter. But pray through. And what does praying through mean? Taking your worries and continually casting them up and letting God know how you're feeling about it and then trusting Him with it and saying, Lord, I give this to you. I surrender this to you. And you might have to do that five minutes later because we're humans, right? We have this incredible gift of forgetting things and so, uh, which will help us post-pandemic. Pandemic. pandemic. But we need to be able to let it go and take an action of faith and trust God that he is dealing with, that he is aware of the situation, that he is already doing it. Now, Satan will say, oh, prayers don't work. <laughs> right? Uh, well, you got to push through. you got to push through to see. The, sometimes you've got to push through to see the results. you got to keep praying until you feel that peace in your heart, that something has changed in the spiritual realm, that God has heard you, and that God has actually been able to do something about it. You know, Daniel prayed and fasted sometimes for seven days. Oh, yeah, we're terrible here in St. John. There's probably a few people that are good at fasting and praying. Well, most of us are terrible at it. You know, if, if you're that worried about something and get serious about your prayer, and, and ask God. And fasting isn't just, you know, fasting is to set the prisoners free and it's also to feed people. So when you, when you go to fast, you can ask God because you're replacing what you're fasting with something else. So if you're, if you're fasting a meal, a lot of times you're actually supposed to give that meal to someone else or take the time you're going to spend eating and serve somebody. So you can fast by giving up something that takes up time, whether it's a TV show. Um, I, at one point I gave up Coke, Coca-Cola. And, uh, and when I gave up Coca-Cola, every time I craved it, I would pray for uh, one of my youth. It was Mitch Black. Love you, bro, if you're seeing this. Uh, and so it actually helped me to be set free from my Coca-Cola addiction. But it also gave me a chance to be praying for someone specifically about a situation I was cared about. So I partnered those two things together. And you can do the same thing, too. So if you are a worrier, actually, you're a warrior. 
and you need to take your worries and you need to take them to someone who can do something about it. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep going. Yes, this is from SpongeBob SquarePants, Mr. Krabs. And we're going to talk about the gift of giving, the giver. And when your gift is twisted in this sense, whether a hurt, you know, I think everybody has the right uh, to, I think people do regardless of whether they have the right or not. But in church, like, you know, if people believe the ministries that are going on because they speak with their wallets, right? People give when they see that it's a good investment. If what they're looking at is happening in the church and they don't feel it's a good investment, that they're not wasting their money because they can waste the money on something else, right? And so uh, there is a difference as well. You know, when we think about giving, right? Uh, if there's something in us that says, well, this better be worth it because this is my hard earned money. And, and whoever uses it needs to be accountable. And I really appreciate our finance people at our church. They're very keen on the accountability to the people who have given. And uh, I think that's so important in any kind of financial role. I try not to have to do too much with finances personally because of uh, the bad reputation that pastors and churches have around money. So I, I try and keep my nose out of it, fingers out of it, and just let our finance people do their thing. Uh, I bring suggestions from time to time, uh, you know, and prayerfully, but I'm thankful that there's accountability systems set up. But when it comes to giving, there's a spirit of generosity. There's supposed to be a spirit of joy. You know, where your heart is, that's, that's where your treasure is. And so if people can get, the, the twist of the gift is that you can become stingy. You can become ungenerous. Or, or you know, one of the worst places to be is just giving without thinking about it. It's probably not the worst. <laughs> at least you're benefiting the ministry. But if you're giving and you're not really even thinking about it, now I challenge you to, to take this as an opportunity to give out of faith. That when you give, you give believing that the Lord is going to take that finances and despite the humans that are administrating it, it's going to go and build the kingdom of God and reach souls. I can remember when Pastor Bill Anas was going to Nigeria to preach and uh, he said the amount of people that got saved when he was doing these big crusades, he said, you know, it was like basically for every every dollar he gave, five people got saved. It was like five dollars a soul is what he said. And, you know, I would take that lighthearted, right? But the idea was that when you give to the kingdom of God, you're not just giving money. You're giving of your time. You're giving of your life. And you're actually partnering because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. And so as you show God that this is the most important thing to me, or, you know, taking the tithe, that first 10% and, and giving, uh, you know, it's, it's incredible blessing to the body of Christ. It builds up the body of Christ. But, you know, tithing isn't the only area of giving. There's, there's tithing, and then there's the fun stuff, I call it, uh, which is your offerings. Uh, so we talked about the chairs. They've all been paid for. Thank you for that. Wow. Way to go, Hillcrest. Uh, you know, well, we were debt-free not too long ago. Uh, we're going to be getting back in debt for some big projects I'm quite excited about. So, but there's also the benevolent giving. So some people say it's just tithes and offerings. Well, just tithes, there's offerings, there's benevolent, uh, you know, helping people who can't ever give back. And it's our joy. You know, think of Christmas time when we gave out uh, more, help more families than we've ever helped before. Like, hallelujah. That's because of you. Right? So uh, as you're giving, give intentionally. Think about where you're giving and how you are building the kingdom of God, but also ask the Spirit of God, where do you want me to give? Right? Because there might be something totally off your radar that God might put on your heart. You know, there's some great ministries in St. John, across the Maritimes, Canada, the States, you know, as the Lord leads you. Now, make sure that you're not being uh, compulsed. Is that even a word? Uh, to, to give. You want to make sure that it's done with a spirit of joy. Because what does it say? 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. Right? Doesn't care what you're offering, cares about your heart. So anyways, let's keep going. Uh, let's talk about uh, Hebrews 4.10. So... This is the gift, the, the gift of helps. So what happens when the gift of helps gets twisted? Well, you become what maybe you've heard of this term, the office martyr. You'll do anything and everything for everybody at your own 
uh, at your own cost, right? Maybe it's like, oh, I haven't, you know, I've been at work for 12 hours straight, or, you know, I didn't take any breaks today, or I didn't even have time for lunch today, or I, I haven't had a weekend off in seven months, or, you know, you become a martyr like that? That's unhealthy. When you're called to serve and you're called to help, you know, one of the twists that happens there is you don't know when to say no. Now, this is the, the kettle calling the, the pot black. I'm, 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 I have been terrible at saying no. I'm getting better. Uh, anybody who's uh, been working with me, I, I, I love the work that God has called me to do. And I have had a murder complex before. I've had a Messiah complex before. That was all up to me. And learning to find those boundaries is absolutely important for your health because you can't do that forever and eventually it will take a toll on your health. So having a martyr mentality, you got to avoid that as, as someone with the gift of help because you love to help. But learning to say no, learning what God has actually asked you to do and how to be involved is absolutely important. Let's keep moving. Pastor, the gift of pastor. When the gift of pastor gets twisted, uh, he takes advantage of the sheep. Ezekiel 34, 1-5 says, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. So the role of pastor is also known as a shepherd, someone who cares for the flock, cares for the sheep, feeds the sheep, watches after them. This is what the sovereign Lord says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. The gift of pastor is for the building up of the church. It's not for building your own kingdom. It's not for getting luxurious cars or suits or anything crazy like that. I mean, I'm sure there's people, I've been given some nice suits over the years. That's fine. Uh, I like the clothes I'm wearing right now, to be honest. But they are only focused on themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds. Clothe yourselves with wood and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You know, I just picture this big fat cat on the throne and the people around them, you know, just they're, they're uh, just being taken advantage of, right? This, this sheep has been fleeced of his coat. I mean, technically being fleeced is supposed to be a healthy thing for the sheep. But when it's just for selfish gain, you know, when, when you come into role as pastor or shepherd, uh, you know, there's many people not in the office of shepherd uh, or pastor like myself, but who have a pastoring gift. People are drawn to you because they sense you care for them. You got to be careful not to take advantage of people who are around you. It's, it's your role to love them and to care for them. It says, you have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly. And brutally so they were scattered because there was no shepherd and when they were scattered they became food for all the wild animals you see when when your pastor is unhealthy and there are times when it is and you know not everybody's gonna like the same pastor right some people are gonna thrive under someone that someone else is gonna just feel like all dried up uh, but there are times when uh, a pastor is unhealthy in general and uh, you know, it's times to make a move and, you know, prayerfully consider that depending on your situation uh, and, and seek the Lord on that. That is a, such a difficult thing. And let, let me tell you this. If your season has come to a close at a church, you're not betraying God by moving on. I, I think that is so difficult sometimes. My role as a pastor is not to keep people all at Hillcrest. My role is to equip the saints for ministry and provide opportunities for them to build up the body of Christ, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if God calls them to some results, hallelujah, let them go, love them and encourage them and pray for them and keep in contact with them, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's, that can be a, a difficult situation. Anyhow, let's keep going. Teachers. Oh, 2 Peter 2, 1. <laughs> False teachers are like brute beasts. They do not want to hear your questions. Teachers. It's, it's more important to, to be able to teach roundedly. Like, don't just teach your opinion. Uh, teach and help people to think critically for themselves. Teach a, a broader a span of things. These are the options. 
and let them, let people, uh, you don't have to control the way people think. It's not your job to create robots. Your job is to lead people in the general direction and let them think and experience Christ for themselves. And to the Spirit of God will lead them to the truth. And, you know, the, the body of Christ is widely diverse, widely diverse. But you can't just take a pulpit and, and pound it and pound your people because it's just going to wear them out. <laughs> it's very similar to the gift of leading and leadership. The difference between a boss and a leader, anybody in the business world has seen these things. And if you've ever experienced it, it is miserable to be under a boss. It's much better to be following a leader. You know, here they meet their goals and it's like, yeah, way to go guys. We all did this together versus look at me, my little, little minions here. They, they helped me, but I don't care. I'm getting all the glory, right? It's, Two different things. There's delegation, but then there's also getting everyone else to do your work for you. Then there's leading and being part of the team, being part of the process. Uh, being a, a micromanager or, or having this elitism thing can cause so much damage. I go to 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 18, King Rehoboam. Uh, they were one of the two sons of Solomon, and he had inherited the throne. And it says this, verse 18, He sent out Adnorim, who was in charge of forced labor, but all of Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam, however, managed to get into his chariot and escape to Jerusalem. He decided he was going to continue on this boss style. And there comes a point where the boss style, people get tired of it, and they do something about it. Let's keep going. Gift of faith. Well, the, the twist of faith is fear, right? Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present requests to God. The twist on fear is that you're sure you're going to lose. The twist on fear, or the twist on faith, I should say, is that you have faith in the wrong thing. You have faith in the calamity. You have faith in the pronunciation. You have faith in the whatever when we need to put our faith in the Word of God, we need to put our faith in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom is very much, this is supposed to be a black apple. You know, uh, It's very much like the prophet. It's, it's, uh, I've seen people use the Word of God to manipulate other people. We don't want to be doing that. I just want to keep going here a little bit. Discerning spirits. So you get a couple different shadows here. First John 4, 1 John 4.1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, which means attitude sometimes, and sometimes it actually means uh, demonic spirit or just spirit in general. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There are many people who want to take advantage of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's terrible, because that affects the rest of us who are trying to do things legitimately, right? Um, what I have noticed is, is a, a twist on the discerning of spirits is, uh, I don't even know if this is even proper to say, uh, it's a proper twist on the, on the gift of God, but I do know that there is an uncanny discerning of spirits amongst abusers and the abused. If you have been in an abusive relationship, you need to not date for about a year because I, I, from what, uh, what I've read is that with, if you date someone within a year, you're bound to end up in the exact same relationship again because there is an attraction between those kind of spirits. It's almost like they can sniff them out or something. I, I've seen it time and time again. So be wary of that. If you have been a victim, then you need to be careful that you aren't walking right into another den or another layer of another wolf. Okay, let's keep on top here. Let's keep going. Administration is the gift. Uh, this, the twist on this, you know, God has given certain people the ability to have uh, detail-oriented policy making. Richard, maybe you're one of the most uh, incredible gifted people in this realm because I often find that people with this kind of gift can put programs ahead of people. Now, Richard, you consistently care about people. I really appreciate that gift that you have. And I've met a few other people like that. Gary Stevens for our Hillsboro uh, audience and David Hawks. There's some different ones like that. But this gift of administration, the twist on it is when the programming and, and the details become more important than the people. There was one time I was a youth pastor and one of the youth came in and I had my back to them. I was working on something. They were trying to talk to me and I never turned around because I was doing something else. And they walked out of the room. And I'll tell you, I, 
I felt some strong conviction and I got up and I went to him and apologized and said, I will never do that again. And even to this day, um, you'll see how my office is set up. When you walk into my office, I turn around from my chair and you don't, there's nothing in between us. There's no computer between us. There's no nothing because I want you to know you have my full uh, attention, right? I think that's important. All right, last one, and then we'll get to the finale here. So mercy. This is, this is, I used to be very judgmental. I used to be very much like the prodigal story on Luke 15, verse 11 to 31, the older brother. I was very judgmental towards other people. I didn't think things were fair. You know, how come they could get away with sinning and, you know, I'm trying to be good and blah, blah, blah. Until one day, God helped me to realize that I am as much a sinner as any other human being. And in fact, the more my eyes were open, the older I got, the more I realized, my righteousness is as filthy rags. Who was I to say these things? And so the, the gift of mercy for me came out of a gift of judgment because I was supposed to have the gift of mercy. I was a kind boy. I think I was a nice guy. But the twist of my mercy gift was that I was very judgmental because <laughs> I didn't think it was fair or whatever was going on. But when, when I realized the grace of God and the power in my life, it changed me from being judgmental to being very merciful. Luke 7, 47 says, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has begin, uh, who's been forgiven little, loves little. The more we recognize. I mean, I mean, we have blinders on for ourselves, right? The more we recognize, or even as this message was being taught this morning, as you consider these things in your heart, we need to ask God to help us, you know, have, have I got a plank in my eye? You know, have I got a plank in my eye? You know, is there something I'm not seeing? Because if the plank's in front of my eye, I can't see, right? I either need an exhorter to come along or I need God to give me a revelation. And so when we look at the gifts that we've just kind of gone through, was there anything in your heart that went, ooh, ah, man, I wish, I wish you hadn't said that because that sounds like me or the, you know what most people do? And I just don't do this. Don't say, oh, that reminds me of this guy. No. You can't change anybody. Only the Holy Spirit of God can. I guess there's one person you have a major influence on. Do you know who that is? Yeah. You. You have major influence on yourself. And so you actually, and, and when we're blind, okay, blind spots are that. You're blind to them. You don't know they're there. You need to ask God to send someone to you, to reveal them to you, or you need him to reveal them to you. And so you ask questions um, like from this Matthew 7, uh, 1 to 5 parable, the plank on your eye. Lord, is there a plank in my eye? Or is there a speck? Is there something in my eye that I can't see? You know, ask yourself this question. And Paul Beal, I love this line. I use it all the time. Am I the villain in anyone else's story? You know, taking yourself out of your shoes into somebody else's shoes and asking those kind of questions like, how are my actions being perceived by others? You know, we're supposed to flee uh, the appearance of evil. But what if our actions, what if we're not realizing our actions are actually being detrimental to the church? What if our, our and I mean in general, what if, what if our actions, you know, as a hammer, instead of putting nails in to build up the body, we're actually putting it right into the drywall, right? The only person you can change is you. And, and if you find yourself operating in some of these twists, you know, the beautiful thing is, it's just like a garden hose, it's not hard to get untwisted. It's usually a wound or it's usually a, a, a hurt that you've experienced or it's, it's, there's just something there. And it could be unforgiveness. It could be a lot of different things. But you ask God for help. And I'll tell you, He will be there to help you. He will help to untwist those things or those thoughts. I mean, it's probably, it's so close to our heart that we can't see it and we need God to set us free. I thank God it took Abraham 80 years, maybe even 100 years, to be ready to give birth to Isaac. Well, Sarah. <laughs> it took Moses 80 years to get ready to deliver Israel. It took Caleb 85 years to even get into the promised land. 
we are a work in progress. But if you can recognize anything from this message today that's in your own life, that is a spiritual gift that has been twisted, or if you even uh, recognize any of these symptoms in your life, surrender it to God. Say, Lord, help me. If you don't know how to receive the change, just say, I don't even know how to receive the change, Lord. Set me free. Well, I trust that uh, God has touched your heart this morning through the preaching of his word. And uh, if you need to talk about this, uh, don't hesitate to give me a shout on Facebook or at the church or send me an email. I, I look forward to connecting with you all. Lord, bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Let's, let's pray before we go out. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would set us free. Lord, where we're twisted up inside, where we're wounded, Lord, bring healing to our bodies that we might build up the body of Christ. We thank you for the spiritual gifts. We thank you for all these things, and we give you all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Your God is faithful, and he will complete the good work that he started in you. We will see you next week.